what is wrong with the education system in your area if anybody ever tried to teach you that you know a boa constrictor should eat you from the feet up and that you should just lay there and it's like that is terrible advice that is awful don't 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 do that people I know, right? Which is especially weird knowing that I live in a swamp. You can step out of my back door and throw a rock and hit a swamp. So it's good information to have. You'd think I would have had it earlier, and technically I did, but we're not we're not gonna go there because it's much funnier the other way around. And we have our resident expert, Kevin, of the Red Caps podcast. Thank you, Kevin, calling in from the Boa Constrictor Haven, that is Canada. Kevin also calls in uh, at a timely point because he is one of the other podcasts doing OSR October. What is OSR October? Well, or OctoSR, depending on which hashtag you prefer. OctoSR is a month of celebration, a month showing off how awesome the OSR is, how the gaming community that sprung up around it, the hobby that's driving it, and the movement of design ethos and gameplay experience is driving great experiences within the OSR, despite what certain elements will have you believe. Kevin actually has a charity page set up. He's doing a fundraiser, which I will link in the show notes. Thank you, Kevin, for setting that up. That's more than I'm doing, more than I can do at this point, but we'll get into that at the end. And I would encourage everybody out there, if you have a blog, if you have a podcast, if you have a channel, think about diving in. So why OSR October? Isn't there RPG a day month? Well, yeah, there is, but... RPG a day is a pan experience. You're not going to bring a monopoly to a Euro game convention. It's just not the same th- experience. It's not what the same people are uh, wanting to play. So while we're not disparaging, we're kind of coming in as an homage. It's a great idea. It's a good opportunity to showcase the uh, play style and the games that we're on so that folks who may not know about them may come in. Alternatively, folks who do know about them but don't know the full depth of it, who may have gotten a bad impression, uh, can come in and see what's actually going on. There was some conversation about uh, cleaning up shop and uh, kind of distracting from undesirable elements in the OSR. That is a bad idea. In part, because the more I listen to what folks want to remove from the hobby, to the people they want to silence in the hobby, the more I realize those folks aren't really that bad people. I'm not going to name anybody, but I'm... So, the first time I heard about DCC was from a group of people who said, it's not OSR, it sucks, it's 3.5 with OSR painted over it. and So I bought DCC and I played it. And I had a lot of fun. Now, is it OSR? Eh, I'd say it's OSR adjacent. But the point is, just because somebody hates something, that's a good reason to check it out. And so I checked out some of the folks that people are uh, hating on. And sure, some of them have a bit of a rough edge. But by and large, they're playing the same games. They're believing the same beliefs about design. And I'm based on some of the ideas that folks are talking about censoring as part of OctoSR is I'm beginning to think I'm part of the bad crowd that they don't want to be around anymore. But um, So I'm not going to get involved in that. I'm not going to get involved in the cancel culture aspect. I think that's counterproductive. Um, however, I do think we need a prompt. This is not the first time we've tried OSR October. And I think the reason it fell apart in the past is the drive to be more freeform. Now, while I respect that OSR experience is primarily driven by your home, it's a DIY environment, it's a framework to build your campaign out of, you can't expect someone to devote a month of content. It's hard enough getting weekly content out. So what I'm going to do is 
I'm going to focus on gaming. I'm not going to talk about people. I'm going to take it back to its roots. What is the OSR? I'm going to read the OSR primer. Uh, Matt Finch original, OG, uh, one of the people who worked on Osric, which tested the limits of the OGL, uh, lent the OSR, its OSR acronym, and probably is one of the seminal works that started the movement. So I'm going to read his perspective. I'm going to read his primer, and I'm going to go through it day by day, and I'm going to tell you about gaming experiences that I've had that illustrate those points and how those points, what contentious or otherwise may be, influence a good experience at the tabletop. I will publish those points as I'm able to make them, and I will uh, leave it to you, the other producers, to follow or not. It's up to you. Now, am I doing a daily prompt? I wanted to, but I'm going to be honest, I don't think I'm going to be able to. I was kind of elected as one of the proponents of this idea primarily because I have social media <laughs> and the other folks who are interested primarily don't, but I haven't been hyping it. Um, I started to, but then Life happened, life got in the way, and honestly, I'm having to pull back on gaming a little bit. Um, the needs of the new baby are growing faster than the family is adapting, so I'm taking on more responsibility. It's not gotten to the point like it was during the pregnancy, but again, you guys are here for gaming, not uh, Taylor Life Updates. I'm having to pull back a little bit. The podcast has been a little bit more erratic. The blog has been pretty steady, but it's probably going to get a little more erratic. And depending on how the next couple of months go, I may end up having to take a break. Is what it is. But what I can promise, I will load what I've got so far. I've got a first week or two uh, out to the 11th uh, recorded. Uh, I have a plan to post an episode every other day in the month of October, so you'll be getting 15 out of me if all goes well. Half of them are done, and um, we'll see where we go. I will post the subjects of each of them, and I will provide those as prompts. Uh, again, you may follow, you may diverge, you may do your own thing, but if you run out of ideas, here I am, hoping to give you some more to keep you moving. In any case, focus on the gaming. That's what I'm going to do, and because that's what it's all about. It's not about the C-list fake celebrities who are doing this or that. It's not about the indie product that you're suddenly having to report on your tax income because you made more than $10 this year. It's about the game, and that's where I'd like to keep it. Take it back to its roots, and take it back to the table. Thanks, everyone, for putting up with the status update, and... Uh, from here, looking forward to October and to call in from a longtime listener, first time caller, talking about chain mail. Hey, Taylor, uh, boss here. I've been really enjoying your Ash Coast game. It's made my drive times to work a lot more fun, so thank you for that. I was wondering, though, I found the uh, initiative system you've been using rather interesting. I think it's called Speed-Based Initiative. I've never actually seen that one in play, though I read about it a bit in several books, of course. I was wondering if you were able to uh, compare it to site-based initiative and individual initiative and talk about the disadvantages and advantages it has compared to either of them. Hope to hear from you. Thank you for the call in, boss. And apologies for the uh, ordeal you had to go through to get it. Uh, for anyone not on a particular Discord that we're on together, uh, boss had downloaded the anchor app signed up for the profile and then found that he had downloaded it just in time for the message feature to go away so he tried to go onto the web the website blew up and he ended up just recording and sending me that message on a discord dm so it worked out thank you boss for working through all of that to get us uh, your voice on the air 
That said, yes, the initiative system that I'm using is actually first strike. Almost rules is written out of the chainmail rulebook. In chainmail man-to-man, the length of your weapon determines the order in which you strike. Uh, I think that it doesn't get a lot of use because it requires a little bit more cognition to process. Uh, in terms of side initiative, side initiative is easy. You roll a die six and then everybody does what they want to do. Simple. Additionally, side initiative allows you to collaborate and figure out how you're going to work together to achieve a particular end with the team. That's, by comparison, a little different than it works on the man-to-man -man table. With man-to-man, -man, you have a different resolution depending on whether it's the first round of your engagement or second and subsequent. On the first round, the if you have a weapon that is two or more, or sorry, more than two longer than your opponent, then you go first. In the absence of a more than two length disparity, the participant who charged goes first. So if you were to come at me with an arming sword, which has a length of four, and I was fighting with a flail, which has a length of seven, I would hit you first because you were outside of my guard, and I was able to make contact, or attempting to at least, while you closed. Then, on subsequent turns, rounds, sorry, on subsequent rounds, the participant with the shorter weapon, so if you had two or fewer, then they go first, representing having gotten inside the guard. This has a little bit of a historical precedent, which is interesting. The pikemen formations in the Middle Ages would frequently carry both their pike, which, would, which could be up to 18 feet in length, but also a mace, because it's a little difficult if you have someone bearing down on you inside the 18 feet of pole that you have going on to make contact. So that front row would drop the pike and whip the mace out. But back to the initiative system. Uh, so in our sample combat, you came at me with your sword. I swung at you with my flail. We both survived. It's now the second round. On the second round, you would go first because you are inside my guard and you have the shorter weapon. In the absence of the two-point disparity, then according to Chainmail, the person who struck first on the previous round strikes first. With the, There's a slight exception on both counts. If you have an elevation advantage, so say that I am going up a flight of stairs to attack you or climbing a ladder to get onto the ramparts to attack you, then you on the height advantage would go first on both occasions. I forget the priority order, but I believe that the uh, height elevation takes precedence over weapon length, but I'm not 100% on that one. That said, I deviate just a tad because I don't give the two point advantage to the person who went last. So the charge, I'll give it to them. But in the absence of a charge, so just moving into combat or, or unordered, uh, unplanned contact with the enemy, then if you are within two weapon length of each other, I have those resolved simultaneously. I feel like that adds a little bit of uh, flair to it. I feel like that adds a little bit of uh, intrigue. And the line from the 1980s Dune comes to mind, Patrick Stewart training uh, Paul Moadib in the knife fighting, the, the slow blade uh, pierces the shield and we would have joined each other in death. Which, that particularly cool line would not make sense if you were using chainmail raw. So I mentioned it has a little bit more cognition to it. Why so? Well, you have to internally reference which round of combat you're on with whom. Uh, and what that's resulted in a couple times is you'll have some participants in the combat going on first round and other participants going on subsequent round. So if I, uh, so say you came at me with the arming sword, I have my flail, and then another player joins the fray, then 
their weapon length would, and their charge would offset, and they would, whether they engaged you or me, be operating under the previous assumption. Uh, that said, OD&D also allows, well, not OD&D, but Chainmail allows uh, 30 feet of movement within the combat, and on the board game, on the war game, that's, I think, primarily utilized to close. So if you have people who are just outside the combat range, you bring them into contact with one another. If you have troops that are changing formation to come up and kind of block each other up and spread out your line, uh, that's used for that. Or wrapping around, if your line is significantly wider, you can encircle a smaller unit. That three inches is for that. But I've been allowing my party to move 30 feet or three inches. And that's turned into some really interesting scenarios. So one in particular, and you will have listened to it, so I'm not spoiling it, but for those of you who haven't been keeping up with the Ash Coast actual plays, you may want to fast forward for just a bit. That's led to some cool scenarios, the first of which, uh, when Jeff was defending the hull against a retreating party, he was able to move back uh, and gain first strike against the zombies that were chasing them. So... The party ran off, and Jeff was continuously able to get the first strike because of his superior weapon length, and he did so by giving ground. And I thought that was interesting because the zombies were pushing him back, pushing him back, pushing him back, and that's not something you get to do in a BX or other ACS type game. If he were to withdraw like that, they would just keep coming at him, and he wouldn't be getting a strike, uh, whereas with the free 30 feet of movement, he's able to reposition himself, and so long as he doesn't move through their threatened zone, then they don't get the free attack. And so that was a pretty dramatic scenario, which uh, it had a dramatic conclusion. And I thought that uh, that by having the freedom of movement and observing that first round, subsequent round kind of pylon, that uh, produces a dramatic effect. Then with the simultaneous initiative, uh, I was editing another AP today the uh, first Ed Foray into the sunken temple of the Guild Horror, there was a, another encounter with the Shambling Undead, and one of the players within two of the, zomb the zombie, specifically he was on the nose, the zombies strike at equivalent weapon length four, and he was using an arming sword, which was weapon length four. Uh, the, he struck and they struck, and while he was, uh, the player, Thaddeus, was uh, uh, unable to take the zombie down, uh, being the zombie requiring two concurrent hits to drop, the zombie was scored a hit and was able to take him down. And so he fell to the floor, having stabbed it through the chest. And um, Hobbs, who was playing his Taganus character, uh, took the opportunity to bash it in, and their magic user, Elias, pulled him dramatically out of the fray. And uh, the other teammates kind of edged in to protect their fallen comrade, again, a very dramatic scenario, very narratively interesting scenario that's not feasible with an ACS combat or, honestly, with chainmail out of the box. Chainmail out of the box, you're either up or you're down, you're dead or you're not. And while uh, Daniel Norton over at Bandit's Keep had pioneered some ideas about narrative defeat, so the, I, I won't, don't quote me on this, it's an old episode, but if the character loses, then they're not necessarily dead. They may be captured, they may be disarmed, they may be all manner of other things at the discretion of the aggressor. But in the Ash Coast game, we're using a wound table. The wound table said Thaddeus went down. And so the roles create that scenario. And that's something that I'm having a lot of fun with. I'm, th I'm very grateful for you listening, and I'm very grateful for the other folks who are watching those APs, because I'm having a blast running them, and I think that the introduction of controlled entropy, that is, using the dice and having a framework around which the dice can create that narrative, even in the combat, it's taking the game in directions that I would not have gone if I were in a storytelling mode. So I've kind of gone off the tangent a little bit. I'm going to have to pause this and uh, save it and then listen to your question again to make sure I answered it. But in short, the initiative system that I'm using is First Strike from Chainmail with a slight modification. Also, the comparison to from D6 Side Initiative, 
Uh, it provides a little bit of a different dynamic. Uh, your players can get a hold of it. You can still plan, but it makes it more difficult. It makes it more tactical. And it gives the fighter one more reason to carry multiple weapons and uh, to trade them out. Uh, looking back at that zombie encounter again, my party, when they were encountering the zombies, had ranged weapons. They threw javelins at them first and took one down in the front rank and then pulled weapons appropriate to the length to try to get that first strike off or at least to try to get in simultaneous and not get dragged down by the weight of numbers. So, yeah, a lot of nuance goes into the fight. One, based on weapon type, because if I'm fighting against someone in plate, I'm going to want to pull out a hammer versus if I'm fighting someone who's unarmored, I'm going to want to pull out a blade. Uh, so, And then additionally on the length. So if I'm fighting someone who's got an arming sword, maybe I want to pull out my dagger. I can get, I can uh, take advantage of the parry where with uh, something I forgot to mention earlier, if you are four or more shorter than your adversary, you get to strike double. So if I have a, if you come at me with an arming sword and I drop my Zweihander on the second round in favor of my dagger, that means I'm now, uh, well, this doesn't work as it's armor, so arming sword is a four, but say you were using a morning star, which is a six, uh, or an axe, which is a five. Uh, I pull out, I, I, I take my first strike on the first round because I have my Zweihander, but then I drop it and pull out my knife. Now, not only did I get the first strike on the first round, but I get a first strike on the second round having a, having a, shorter weapon, but also I get a second strike against you because the um, because the weapon is, is so much shorter and I'm inside your guard. Uh, the, uh, parry comes into mind. Uh, no one has tried to parry yet. No one has asked about it, but this is also a good point where parry might come into play. So say you close with your axe and I have my Zweihander. I take my first strike. You take your strike at me. I'm a little intimidated because I know that you can't, uh, you didn't go down with my Zweihander. I pull out my dagger and I volunteer to parry. Now your attack, well, because I'm so much shorter, I get my first, uh, I get my first strike and then you get your strike at me. If you miss because of the parry, I now get a second follow-up strike. So not only are you striking at a penalty to protect me, but also I'm striking at you multiple times. So there's a lot of strategy that goes into picking a weapon uh, with chainmail man-to-man. And that kind of granularity, while it's kind of difficult on paper, and I think that this is what I'm talking about when I say it's more complicated than D6 side initiative, it is much more, much more thought goes into it, but that thought takes it in directions you wouldn't think it was going to go, and it gives your fighter a lot to think about. In the past, you have your magic users, and the magic users are the ones, or the clerics are the ones, the spellcasters. They have to think more than the fighter, because the fighter, he brings his sword, and he brings his shield, and he brings a bow. Done. No, not in chainmail. You have to think. Uh, where with a magic user or a cleric, your toolkit is the spells that you pick, and you have to think ahead, figuring out what you're going to do. The fighter, now you're bringing an arsenal with you. You bring a weapon based on what you think you'll encounter. You bring a second weapon in case the first weapon gets disarmed or dropped. You bring a third weapon just in case you need to get inside the guard. So the fighter very rapidly becomes the most uh, thought-inspiring unit in the game, uh, in my experience to date so far. We have not gotten to the point where I've got spellcasters slinging multiple spells in a given uh, encounter yet. So we'll see uh, how that takes us when we get there. All right, I went back and I re-listened to your message. I do think I hit all the points, and I probably went off on a tangent or two, too, there. <laughs> Got a little bit of deep dive. Maybe this will be my deep dive into experiences in chainmail so far. Uh, there's my episode title, Experiences in Chainmail with Boss, the Swamp German. So, anyway, thank you for calling in. Hopefully, I'll get a Eurozone game in one of these weeks, and uh, you'll be able to play with us. Who knows? Uh, we'll ruin your commute doing that one of these days. Thanks for calling in, and thank you for putting up with all of the shenanigans it took to get there. Delve on.
The Clear Square Ringmail podcast is an independently owned and operated product released for educational and informative purposes under the Totally Steal This license, which is kind of like Creative Commons, except f- licensing. Segments recorded within a vehicle are recorded using a Bluetooth hands-free device in conjunction with local vehicular safety legislation. The music for the Clear Square Ringmail podcast is Gold Coffee by Michael Ramirez C. Retrieved from Mixkit.co and used under the Mixkit royalty-free music license. Sound effects used in the Clear Square Ringmail podcast are also retrieved from Mixkit.co and used in accordance with the Mixkit free sound effects license. Clear Square Ringmail does not ascribe to nor endorse views or opinions expressed by call-ins, guests, or even the host, unless you think they're awesome, and thus does not assume any liability regarding the consumption or distribution of this podcast. By listening to the Clear Square Ringmail podcast, you agree to these provided terms. Parties with questions regarding these terms, conditions, or releases are encouraged to reach out to Clear Square email at the prescribed methods provided on the Clear Square email blog. Parties dissatisfied with these terms, conditions, or releases are encouraged to go suck an egg.